your attention to 2 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. My, my, my. Let me call your attention to 2 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 4. Long live 2 Corinthians. We will be telling our great grandchildren about 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, first six verses, verses 1 through 6. In the New Testament, the book is 2 Corinthians, the chapter is 4, verses all 1 through 6. You found them, you will discover these words. New King James Version. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age or this world has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord. In ourselves, your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want to say to you, don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hearts. Don't lose hope. We are going through some things in this, the 21st century. And we are going through some things that our foreparents never saw coming and never had to exist in. People all over the world, even celebrities, are walking in discouragement. Who would have thought the famous Halle Berry would be discouraged. Who would have thought 
that Tom Brady to have been said to be the greatest quarterback of all time would be depressed. Who would think that the most prolific college football coach, Deion Sanders, would admit that when he was at the peak of his baseball career and his football career, that he, even going to the Super Bowl, even going to the World Series, could not find happiness anywhere. If Dion was here today, he would tell you that a new woman won't fix it. He has also said that two, three women could not do it. He said that you can ride in anything you can want to ride in. And, and he talks about the fact that one day he was getting to the hotel and the whole team was on the bus. And when they drove up, Dion had had a Lamborghini delivered. And he told the dealer, when you park it out front in front of the hotel, leave the doors open and up. So when we drive up, the guys will ask the question, who does that belong to? One guy on the bus said, who else would do something like that other than Deion Sanders? Deion says that even in the height of his career, sadness, discouragement, disappointment resided in him. This is also the point that the Apostle Paul makes this morning in 2 Corinthians. When you look at 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says he has to defend himself against the critics. And not only does he defend himself, but he also defends Apollo. Many times critics will come after you even when you're doing the right thing even when you're headed the right way, even when the children are obedient, the critics will come. Even when the spouse and you are on one accord, the critics will show up. Well, to young folk these days, we understand very well, if you're single, they want to know when you're going to get married. If you're married, they want to know how long you're going to stay with them. If you have children, they want to know why you go get those bad children. If you don't have them, they want to know when you're going to have them. Critics will show up even when you're locked into God. The tragedy in the text is the fact that the Apostle Paul is locked into God and the church folk are his critics. So Paul stops by here at chapter 4 just to give a little encouragement to all of us this morning. The Apostle Paul says, we are called to this ministry. I want to give you an A, a B, and a C, and I'm going to let you go home and do whatever you do on Sunday. The Apostle Paul says to us, first of all, we must accept God's blessing. If we're going to be triumphant, if we're going to be successful, if we're going to keep from losing our hearts, if we're going to keep from losing hope, if we're not going to go through depression, we got to accept God's blessing. He says, he says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Paul says that there's a ministry and I say to you this morning, there's a ministry in all of us. It amazes me. It amazes me every fourth Sunday. When children get up and they, they sing music that they have brought. They play instruments with the skill that I will never achieve. They speak, and I've seen them grow in monumental direction and let me tell you, I am so pleased and I believe God is so pleased when we have children who can do what they do and never flinch. Now, on the other hand, we have adults. 
They don't want any parts of standing up here. They don't want to even think about you calling me to do anything. <laughs> it's because the children are innocent at the point where they really don't know any better. But when they get to know better, if they don't see some positive figures and role models around them, they're going to crawl back into their shell just like some of us. The Apostle Paul says, we have been called to ministry. That's why we don't, we don't have any committees at our church. We don't have any committees because every single thing that you come across at the New Beginning Church ought to be ministry. We ought to make sure it is ministry, and the ministry is to glorify God himself. When we're doing ministry, we get tired sometimes. When we're doing ministry, we get frustrated sometimes. I recall just last night, I'm, I'm sitting up looking at the clock, and the clock is looking at me. It was right around the time that you were turning over for the 16th time. It was right around the time that you were slowing, snowing, sleep, and slavering. It said 2-2-1. Two, two, and before 2-2-2, two, 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 I wanted to be dead asleep, but I stopped by to tell you at 2-2-1, two, two, I'm staring at the clock, and the clock is staring at me. And I'm not talking about room 221. I'm, I'm not talking about the TV show. I'm not talking about room 222 or 223. I'm talking about a clock with red letters just staring at me. I looked over. And the clock wasn't staring at her. And she wasn't staring at the clock. I'm staring at the clock at 2 a.m., 2.21 a.m., and it's because there are so many things going on around us and with us. It is prayer time. Paul says that we have to accept God's blessing. If you want to come out of this despondentness, if you want to get rid of discouragement, if you want to get rid of this fast-paced life, accept the blessings that God has given you. Paul says God has given us a ministry. God has put ministry in all of us. And because God has put ministry in all of us, we got to accept the blessings that God has given us. I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree wholeheartedly. I don't agree much, but I agree with Paul. I agree, I agree with Steve Harvey on this. If you want to see how good life is for you, begin to count your blessings one by one and name them one by one. Steve Harvey says that if you think things are going bad for you and you're having a bad day, what you need to do is make sure you talk about the blessings of God and, and accept what God is doing to you, accept what God is doing through you, and see, accept what God is doing with you. Because God has placed in all of us a gigantic ministry. And this ministry is one that we will be scrutinized on. It will be one that people will always have something to complain about. I say to you, if you complain about the choir, you ought to be in the choir. If you complain about the musicians, you ought to be playing an instrument. If you complain about the preacher, you ought to find your way in the pulpit and I'll slide over and give it to you. My first four months, first four months as a pastor, guy said to me, you ain't said nothing to me in four months. He said, you, you hadn't preached and you hadn't talked about the word to me. You haven't reached me in four months. Now, I could have said a lot of things, but I said to him, I tell you what I'm going to do. Sunday morning, when we get to the church house, I'm going to get up and announce you as the preacher for the day. Oh, no, man, don't do that. Don't be playing with God. No, I'm not playing with God, and I'm not playing with you. If you think you can do it better than I can, I'm going to announce you as a preacher for the day, and I'm going to sit, and I'm going to criticize, and I am gonna, I'm going to scrutinize you just like you scrutinize me. Paul is at a point. Paul is at a point where they'll scrutinize him. They're scrutinize, scrutinizing Apollos. They are... They are saying that they are crafty in their presentation. They are saying they are deceitful in their message. 
And I agree, Brother Miles, that there are some preachers that are deceitful and they are crafty. And these guys really got it. I mean, they have, they're like a magnet. They, they, they are like a magnet. They draw people to them. And the problem is people just keep on being drawn to them. Paul says, we have a ministry in us. And because we have a ministry in us, we need to understand we got to stop losing heart. Stop losing hope. Stop letting folk talk down and talk against us because we are doing a great deal and because God is blessing us. Let me tell you, if your children are in church, don't let your, your kin folk talk church down. If your children love the Lord, don't let your kin folk tell you that baby it doesn't take all that to, to raise a child. There have been many who have talked down children, who have gone to church, and now their children are off the hinge. Their children are all messed up because they didn't put some God in their lives in the beginning. Let me tell you, if you want a child to come out in a godly way, you got to put some God in their heart before they come out the womb. You ought to read to them. You ought to study with them. You ought to spend some time with them. I oftentimes tell men, you know that, that, that you can give and you can pay and you can give money, but child support never raised a child. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes putting something into them. Reverend Jesse Jackson was right when he said that if anybody can have a baby. You're not a man because you can make a baby. You are a man because you can provide for a baby and protect the baby. That's when you are a man. We have this ministry in us. Paul goes on to talk about past this pericope he calls us as cracked pots he he calls us as earthly vessels that that got problems anybody in the room have any problems in anybody in the room just have one or two problems let me tell you i have some problems i have some problems that i can't fix on my own I have some problems that are going to have to keep going to Jesus with it. I have some problems that, that I got to make sure that Jesus gets my attention and I get God's attention. Let me tell you, Jesus is trying to get our attention. Jesus is trying to get our attention. He, he wants this ministry in you. Man, girl, boy, sister, there's a ministry in you that God is trying to pull out of you and you fighting it off. There's a ministry in you. There is a ministry. Paul says, we have received mercy, and we do not lose heart. We cannot lose heart. Let me tell you, it's, it's mercy of God. It's God's mercy that has kept us. It's God's mercy that has brought us. It's God's mercy that's keeping us. It's not because you're so smart. It's not because of your degrees. It's not because you've been so holy so long. It's only because of God's mercy that you are who you are. You see, his mercy means, his mercy means that you messed up and, and you deserve death. But God kept waking you up this morning and he wouldn't let you die. He reached down with the finger of love, touched you and your eyes flew wide open. God's mercy came running and justice could not have her way. He says, we have this, this mercy in these clay pots. We have this mercy as vessels. We, we have this mercy. And because God has given us mercy, we ought to make sure that we accept God's blessings. Can you think of two things? Can you think of three things? Can you think of 25 things? Can you think of anything that God has blessed you? And God just keeps right on blessing. We serve such an awesome God. We serve such an such a amazing God. We serve such a, such a God that he keeps us when we don't deserve to be kept. Somebody else long gone that was more Christian than we were. Let me verify that more Christian. They act out more Christianity than you act out. But for some reason or the other, God left you here one more day, left you here one more minute so you can lift him, lift up Jesus, and make sure that the people see Jesus in you as a ministry. Accept your blessings. Just accept your blessings. I told you before, I walked off the college campus, walked out to the college to see him after graduation, and daddy gave me my brand new car. It was a, it was a, it was a 1978. Ford Zephyr, maroon. 
It was a 1978 Ford Zephyr. Now, I graduated in 81. I graduated from college in 83. So here I am in 1983, walking out, daddy handing me keys. He's proud to give me the keys to my 78 Ford Zephyr. Now he's giving me the keys to a 78 Ford Zephyr. This is 1983. I'm graduating from college and I'm, and I'm treating it just like it's back brand new. Because I'm going to count my blessings. I'm, I'm going to name them one by one. And, it, and children have to stop putting their parents in a bind to buy stuff they can't afford. And plastic is not something you can afford. I see folk all the time. I see folk all the time. You know, I'm, I'm watching and I'm listening. I see all the time, will this be cash or charge? Charge it. The first thing that comes to my mind, Sister Whitlock, are they spending God's money? I, I don't know them. <laughs> and my first thing that comes to my mind, Sister Paul, are they giving their 10% to Foley's, to Macy's, to J.C. and Penny's? When they ought to have given that first 10% off the top to God. I'm just saying, I don't know these people. I can't judge them. I'm, I'm just asking a question. And I'm not asking them the question. I'm just asking the question up in the air, up in the air. I'm just asking the question. I wonder how they sent in. I wonder how they returned that first 10%. Let me tell you, you ought to make sure your children have a budget now because the ministry is in them, and that ministry is one that they can finance for life and from now on. You ought not live from pillar to post. You know, not live from paycheck to paycheck. That's not a godly demonstration. And if you're there, don't stay there. I've been there. I've been there. I I've been to the point where I couldn't afford peanut butter. So, Sister Hughes, when I get to the peanut butter line, I accept God's blessing. I can go to the house now, and I can get a big old jar of peanut butter. And some of you got to have bread for your peanut butter. But I take a big old spoon. It's bigger than a tablespoon. Matter of fact, Sister David gives me a spoon sometime. I say, what am I going to do with this little bitty spoon? Well, this regulatory size spoon. I don't need that little bitty spoon. I take a big old spoon, a big old huge spoon, Daniel, and I dig down in the peanut butter. I don't need any bread. I don't need any jelly. I just take that whole spoon and, and cram it in my mouth. It's protein. But I could not eat peanut butter today had I spent all the money I had yesterday. I couldn't eat, man, when I get to the peanut butter aisle, Brother Carter, I look at where God has brought me. I watch what God has done to me. You need to make sure that you understand that you have to accept the blessings of God. Whatever he's done for you. You just tell children, don't get in a hurry to get grown. Don't get in a hurry to get grown. We got 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds talking about I'm grown and living at home. Don't get in a hurry to get grown because you need to enjoy who's buying the bacon, the eggs, the ham, and the grits right now because there's going to come a day that you're going to have to buy it yourself and you ain't going to want to. Boy, that's terrible English. You, you're not going to want to. You're not going to be able to. If you don't prepare today, then you won't be able tomorrow. We got to teach children. We got to teach children. I challenged every child at the New Beginning Church. I sent them a, a picture of my coins. I had a gallon bucket here for quarters, a two-gallon bucket here for dimes, and a, a gallon bucket here for nickels. I took a picture, and I said, where, where is your gallon? Where are you in your savings? Where are you with it? Because rainy days will come. Paul says it's a rainy day now. People will always judge you about what they don't know about you. People will always look at you based on your color, based on how you stand, based on how you live, based on where you live, based on who you were born to, based on how you got here. Let me tell you, don't worry about any of it. God has your back. God is in control. Count the blessings that God has given you and count them and name them one by one. Whenever, whenever a young lady... Or a young man come to me, and they are just so madly in love. Brother Hopper, they just so loved it. Oh, I like the way she walks. Pastor, you ought to hear her voice. 
Voice has never paid a bill. Voice has never created love. And she may be bow-legged because she got bad knees, so <laughs> there's no sense in you talking about how bow his legs are because you need to understand that it's what on the inside of you that makes you who you are. Paul says, I got a ministry in me. And he says, that the ministry in me, verse 10, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Paul says that, that we have gotten rid of sin. We've, we have walked away from craftiness. There are so many people, there are so, there are so many people, there are so many people who think they are so crafty. They think they are, they are so good at scheming. There's always somebody who wants your money. And there's always somebody who wants your honey. You get those phone calls. I get three, four calls, five, six, seven, eight calls a day. It says potential spam. When it says potential spam, you know it's a spam. When it's, it asks you, do you want to block? Yeah, you block. By the time you get that one blocked, another one comes with a different phone number from the same place. There are crafty people out there. There are people who want your stuff, your hard-earned stuff. They want your stuff, sister, or whatever you work hard for, that is what they want. They don't want to work. They want you to work, and then they come and get your stuff. Little boy got killed. A few years back, a little boy got killed. I think he was like 17 years old. Woman at work. She's at work. Her alarm goes off. She goes home. She looks around. She starts on the back side of the house in between two houses, and this guy comes out from the back side of her house with her stuff. She shoots him, and he dies. You know, news reporter knows who to pick. News reporter always put the microphone and the camera in the face of somebody that's going to say something crazy. So they interviewed his little cousin that may be in her 20s. And, and she asked a question to the news reporter. How is he going to get his money? He got to do something to get his money. So people are around just trying to live off you. Young people, getting rich quick just won't do it. As quick as it comes, let me tell you, it's going to leave. So accept God's blessing. God is blessing you. God has blessed you with skills. God has blessed you with wisdom. God has blessed you with good parents. God has blessed you with good leadership. Stay with God. Paul says we are, we are walking. They, they, they have come to the conclusion that we are walking in craftiness. He says we are not walking in craftiness. We are not conning and conniving. Nor are we handling the word of God deceitfully. We're not here to deceive people. Young folk, you know what deception is? Is when you don't tell the whole truth or you leave something out. Did you do that? No, I didn't do that. Do you know who did that? No, I don't know who did that. But there is something you know. When you leave something out, you are being deceitful. And if you are taking a lie detector test, the lie detector meter will go crazy. <laughs> Nor are we handling the word of God deceitful. We are not doing it for our own selves. I got a whole lot of things that I can do <laughs> other than this. But God has called us. He says that God has called us and we need to accept our blessings. He says God has called us and, and the manifestation of the truth and, and he's commending ourselves to man and we are making sure that we have a good conscience. So we are here for your purpose. It amazes me when every contractor says, if you just need us, call us. We are here for you. And I'm like, you here for $25,000 and, and 28 cents. That's why you here. They'll tell you in a minute, oh, we are here for you. Just call us anytime. And once they get that $25,000 and 28 cents, you will never be able to call and complain because they got it and they're gone. So, so it says... We are here for you. Our consciousness is in the sight of God. We ought to govern ourselves like Christians. My, my next point is believe in where God is taking you. Believe, where God, believe in where God is taking you. 
regardless of how tough things may be. And next Sunday, we will deal with these tough things. But believe where God is taking you. Believe where God have you now. Believe that wherever you are now, God can fix it, and he's the only one who can fix it for you. Believe in where God is taking you. God is taking you some places that you have never been. He's taking you to do some things you've never done. He's taking you to meet some people you've never met. He's taking you to become more educated than you've ever been. The God we serve is the God of the entire universe, and God can do it. Stop hanging around with negativity because negativity becomes contagious. Believe where God is taking you. Don't try to scheme your way through. Work your way through. He says, he says what you need to understand is that there's a manifestation of the truth. There's a manifestation of the gospel. We have to stay with the gospel truth. And as we stay with the gospel truth, God is able to bless us. Believe in where God is taking you. God is taking us. Some, I would never have agreed. I would never have believed. I would never have said yes that I would end up in Houston, Texas with three million people. And now it's much more. I would have never thought that this little person from the backwoods of Mississippi, four mile Mississippi, you can look now and see if it's on your map. So far in the country is nine miles north of Belzona, Mississippi. It is, it is nine miles uh, southeast, southwest rather, of Inverness, Mississippi. It is 25 miles south of Indianola, Mississippi. And look at me now. My daddy was a sharecropper. My mama traveled into town to do nursing. And she had to drive those back roads with no lights. I drove through there the other day, and they have, mo they have modernized the place. And I messed around and let nightfall got there. I was like, oh, Lord, how mercy. How did we live out here? Now I've come to the big city, and I see lights. I don't see darkness. I see lights. And I, when you poor, you don't know you're poor. I thought it, I thought it was a lifestyle that everybody lived. I thought when people went to, went, to, went to school, everybody that I knew had patches on their knees. Everybody that I knew, they, their brother, if their brothers and sisters were about the same size, I wore the blue, the blue jeans on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Levon wore the black jeans on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And we were embarrassed because we had patches on our knees and patches on our backside. We were embarrassed. Now you got children that go buy jeans with holes in it. Go buy jeans with patches all in it. Now it's a brand new style. Guess what? I don't have to change because the style is going to run out and it's going to come right back to what I'm wearing today. All I have to do is keep moving. My, my high school history teacher, Mr. Mr. Tommy White, he never changed his wardrobe. In 1981, he was still wearing bell bottoms. In 2023, he's still wearing bell bottoms. And let me tell you, the, thing, the truth of the matter is, bell bottoms came in, bell bottoms went out, he kept wearing his bell bottoms. Bell bottoms came back in, and these children think that their bell bottoms are, are what they had, and they, they found a new thing. We had bell bottoms, afros, and dashikas a long time ago. All you got to do is wait on the trend. It's coming in. It's, uh, chick jeans came in. Chick jeans going out. 501 came in. 501 came out. You cannot pattern yourself after other folk. The, the, the industry is trying to keep you down and walk you down. You need to make sure you believe in where God is taking you. And if you get in a crowd where everybody's going the same way, you're going the wrong way. You got to go the way of the Lord. Paul says that we are going the way of the light. He says, he says that, that we commend ourselves with, with good conscience. We, we make sure that we do present the gospel well. And even if the gospel is veiled, even if it's covered, even if the gospel is something that some people can't see. And let me tell you, some people won't be able to see what you see in the Lord. 
and it is, it is veiled. Paul says it is covered. Paul said it is darkness because people who walk in darkness can't see the light. When he talks about the light, he's talking about a beam. He, he's talking about a beam of light that shines in one direction and keeps it in that direction. And whenever that beam is shining for you, you have to walk in God. And as you walk in God, God is able to keep that beam. Let me tell you, the word of God is the light. The word of God is the beam. The word of God is a light to our feet and a lamp to our walking path. The word of God keeps us. He says it is, it is because they have been blinded. They've been blinded by the God of this world. He says the God of this age. They've been blinded. Don't expect unholy people to see holy things. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he, he goes on to say that these things of God are spiritually discerned. And those who are not in Christ, they can't see it because they are natural men and natural women. And you can't expect natural folk to see what spiritual folk can see. There's, there's about this much. My daddy was a mechanic. My daddy was a welder. My daddy was a carpenter. My daddy built the, the, the property up. He was a grader. He was a heavy equipment operator. And because he was, a, he was a carpenter, we went and helped him carpent. Because he was, he, he was a mechanic, I laid on the car with him and, and changed uh, the, the, the transmission out every year. But guess what? I know about that much about being a mechanic. Daddy knew this much. I know about that much about being a mechanic because I'm not called to that. But I am called to looking at the prince and saying that ought to go here, it ought to go here, that ought to do this, and you ought to do this, and I can sit back and watch the mechanic work. What we have to understand is the natural people know that much about spiritual things. And the thing that trips me out, the people that don't go to church, they are always telling the church folk what the church ought to be doing. They're always saying, oh, I don't go to church because the church is not doing this and the church is not doing this. they telling church folk what the church ought to be doing and they are not a part of the group. What do I look like walking in the music room and tell Sister Davis, you can take the day off now? Now, I am going, I'm going to be the director now. Children, children will laugh me out the room. Matter of fact, I went in there one day and I tried to play the pre-quarter and they just stared at me. Matter of fact, they bust out in unison laughing at me. Because the natural man cannot receive the things of God. It's only because we have to believe where God is taking us. Rejoice that you're a Christian. Rejoice that you're going to heaven. Rejoice that you're able to exist on planet earth and live a great life while you're here. I've said to you several times, if, if I'm found unconscious and they say it's because of alcohol or it's because of drug, let me tell you, it's something foul has happened. Let me tell you, I didn't put it in my system. They put it in my system. You, you, you would never see me drink until I fall out. You would never see me put drugs in my system. And I want every child in this room to understand that you don't need anything else to control you. I like being in control, especially in control of myself. I think God has great places he's taken me, and I can't be taken that way if I'm not in control of myself. The wise writer says it like this, a man who has no control over his own spirit is like a city whose walls are broken down. A child who has an attitude that, that has no control is like a city whose wall broken down. You see how the children in this room just sit in quietly and they're writing notes about the sermon? And they are, they're saying number one and then they put that next to that. And You see how manable they are in here? It's because they've been taught control. Now, children, don't leave me hanging now. I made, I made some claims today. Don't leave me hanging. Brother Miles going to stand up with, with all seven foot and look over on his tiptoes and see. And come back to me and say, Pastor, I don't see one note. <laughs> I, I see somebody playing on the phone, but they're not in the Bible. 
We have to teach. We have to train. We have to make sure that young people know what life ought to be like. Believe in where God is taking you. My final one is C. Accept God's blessing. Believe where God is taking you. And conclude that God's light is sufficient. Conclude, come to the conclusion, conclude that God's light is sufficient. It says in verse number five, you always talk about they've been blinded and the gospel of Christ is the glory. When it gets to, and it talks about the fact that God is Jesus, Jesus is God, meaning that Jesus is the invisible image of the, vi the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. God has rolled himself up in flesh. God has made a difference. God has come to planet Earth. God sent Moses and folk wouldn't hear him. God sent Noah and people wouldn't hear him. God sent David and people wouldn't hear him. God sent Aaron and people wouldn't hear him. God said, look, I'm going to go down there myself. And God got off in Bethlehem of Judea. They laid God in a manger. They wrapped him in grave clothes. God himself shows up and he went straight to the ghetto. There was a song right around Christmas time in, in the black neighborhood. They would sing a song and the song would say, Santa Claus goes straight to the ghetto. What they have to understand is God had already shown up in the ghetto. When God showed up in the ghetto, there was no reason for Santa Claus to show up. So they create this fictitious character in Santa Claus. God has already showed up in the ghetto. And when God shows up in the ghetto, he levels the playing field. No one is better than anybody else. God shows up. He showed up through Jesus. Walk these mundane shores. He, he did good. God brought light through Jesus the Christ. Darkness had to leave because Jesus showed up. The Bible says that he's talking about this God. Right there in verses 5 and 6, he's talking about the God who created something for nothing. The earth was null and void. There was darkness upon the deep. And God spoke and light came. This light is Jesus Christ. We ought not lose hope. Do not lose hope. Don't lose hope. Come to the conclusion that God's light is sufficient. Brothers and sisters, God is cool. It's cool to be with God. It's cool to hang out with God. It's, it's all right to be a bookworm when it comes to the word of God. It is cool to be with God. It's, 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 it's not a bad thing to be called a, a Bible thumper. It's cool to be with God. He says, he says that Jesus is the Lord. And we preach Jesus. We preach God, the light of God. We preach Jesus and not ourselves. And he says that I am a bond servant. In other words, I am a servant. I'm a slave. I'm a slave. I'm a slave for God. I'm making sure that I labor for God. I'm making sure that I do all I can for God. I'm making sure that I understand that whatever I'm going through now, if God is allowing me to go through it, God has a plan. And God has a wonderful plan for your life. And it does not matter if you put yourself in this position or somebody else put you in your position. Just trust who God is. Paul says we walk away from sin. We, we leave sin behind us. He says, when I go, I am a runner. And he says, when I run, I strip down to barely anything because I'm running this race. And in this race, I'm here to win. Anybody in the house here to win? I am here to win. I, I don't like losing. Anybody like losing? Are there any losers in the house? Let me just serve notice to you. You are not a loser. You are a winner. When you walk with God, you'll win. I'm going to win every time because I walk with God. I can't lose with the stuff that God uses. I, I, I am walking with God. I'm a winner. I'm going to be a winner till Jesus gets back. And then when I get there over yonder, I'm still going to win. 
Now, people, you're winners. Don't, don't let people talk about your fashion and make you depressed. Don't let, let people talk about your walk and make you depressed. Don't, don't let people talk about the color of your skin and make you depressed. Don't let people measure you against somebody else and make you depressed. Don't let people talk about your body shape and your frame and make you depressed. Let me share with you, God made you, and he made you just like he wanted to make you. You are beautiful and well put together, and because God has put you together, you ought to accept your blessing. You you ought to bless God for where he has taken you. And you ought to come to the conclusion that God's light is sufficient. God's light is sufficient. That's why we read our word. So God can shine a light in our lives. When, 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 you, when you read the word, God unveils some things. Paul says there are some things that are hidden to those who are not saved. But to those of us who are born again, those of us who are saved, he gives us glory to glory to glory to glory. He shines a light, and the closer we get to death, the light gets brighter. And God is able to keep us. You don't want to walk in darkness. When you walk in darkness, you stumble over stuff. When you walk in darkness, you, you trip over stuff. When you walk in darkness, you twist stuff. In my house, I always say, don't, put, don't leave those shoes right there now. In late night when I get up, I don't need anything in my pathway because I've had a twisted ankle. And that was at 37. I can't afford a twist, twisted ankle at 60. Can you imagine, Brother Hopper, can you imagine at 60 years old I have a twisted ankle? It, it took six weeks for me to get healed from that one. Let me tell you, it may take six years for me to get healed. I used to run with these young people and play basketball and get tough with them. If one of them pushed me down now, I'm ready to fight. I can't afford to be pushed down. I mean, you crack a bone on me now, I learn how to move. I know how to get out of the way. Even in martial arts, they tell you regardless of your skills, Regardless of how good you are, you can be a green belt, a blue belt, a red belt, or a black belt. Regardless of your skill, your first defense is to move out of the way. So when I see a locomotive coming, a 260-pound fella coming, I know how to get out of his way. But we need to understand that God has blessed us and he gives us all that we have. And we don't have to go anywhere looking for what we need. God's light is sufficient. Some writer said, walk in the light. The beautiful light. Walk in the light, the beautiful light, because God is able to bless us in the midst of light. You see, I, I used to notice in high school, the good Christian girls always wanted the bad boys. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me, Sister Woods, why, why girls that grow up in church always want somebody that's on the opposite side. <laughs> they, they always want to explore. They, they always want. Now, check this out. Even the dope dealer wants a praying wife. Even the prostitute wants a praying husband. Even those who locked in darkness, they want somebody to pray them out. And you can tell when things get bad and things go wrong, they're not going to run back to the pub. They're not going to run to the club. They're going to run to the church. And when they run, they're looking for somebody to shine some light on them. When I said even the Christian girls want bad boys, Sister Henry looked at Brother Whitlock and said, you ain't a bad boy, are you? We have to get to a point in our lives where we hang out with our like kind. We have to get to a point in our lives where, where we appreciate what God is doing. God is doing ministry to you. God is enlightening you. And he, he says to us that that darkness has to flee because God is shining his lights on our hearts. And he's giving us knowledge. He's giving us glory. And it is the glory of God and it is done through the face of Jesus the Christ. If God's going to bless us, he's going to bless us through Jesus. The same Jesus that hung, the same Jesus that died, 
The same Jesus that voluntarily gave his life. The same Jesus they buried in a borrowed tomb. The same Jesus that got up early that third day morning. God has delivered light to us in the face of Jesus. For when we see Jesus, we see God. We see God's love, God's mercy, God's compassion. We see God's joy, God's peace. If you want peace, you need God. That's why we got to pray. No prayer, no power. Little prayer, little power. Little reading of the word, no power. We have to understand that God has given us Jesus. Jesus the Christ that walks with us. And he talks with us. The Apostle Paul says that the Holy Spirit has transformed us as we walk in Jesus. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Don't give out. Don't give in. And don't give up. Keep calling on God. And watch what God does. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to try Jesus. He is the righteous son of God who died for us and rose from the dead. His name is Jesus. There is none like him. If you have not received Jesus as your personal savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know Jesus. It's not a difficult task. Just try him. Try Jesus. The door is open. Come to Jesus. Just as you are. Don't wait till you fix it up. Don't wait till next Sunday or Wednesday. Come to Jesus just as you are. He majors in the impossible. Trust him. And bless him. The door of the church is open. Will you trust Jesus? If you've never received him as your personal savior, would you bow your head with me and invite him into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried in a borrowed tomb. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you honestly trusted Jesus as your Savior, believing that he died on Calvary and rose early that third day morning, we believe that you're now saved. You're born again. You're on your way to heaven. We believe that you're walking in the light. We believe that you're walking in the beautiful light. That light is Jesus text says that he has shown his light and because he has shown his light we see clearly now and we all struggle even after we come into the light we struggle with stuff with our wants and our needs but we have to leave it at the feet of Jesus and trust Jesus to handle it for us Jesus is the one who makes all the difference. The door of the church still stands ajar for those who want to come. Even after the benediction, the, church, the door of the church is ajar. It's standing wide open because God wants to bless us.